so yeah, this is a talk that I did for uh, at ISSW this year. First, thanking the co-authors, Eric, who you've met, and Simon, who both have master's degrees related to wet snow. So this was great to work with them on this. They're uh, incredible resources. And Ben uh, from the Sawtooth Avalanche Center. So Ben and I were, uh, you know, basically seeing this really interesting uh, avalanche phenomenon and then talking to people about it and just being curious and decided to put something together on it. That's kind of the root of, of how this project came about. So a little audience participation. So here we have simple uh, wind slab, new snow, you know, not a huge deal. Who feels pretty comfortable, um, you know, managing or handling this situation when you're out there in the course of work? Really? Like four of you? Are you guys all asleep? Okay, sorry. Soft slab, 20 to 30 centimeters deep. It snowed six inches overnight, blew 20 to 30, 5% density snow. People generally feel pretty confident. Like, obviously, they're. Yeah. Too much thinking. <laughs> Dumb it down, Margaret. Dumb it down. <laughs> but in general, uh, you know, most folks feel like that's it's probably a manageable scenario. If nothing else, you can avoid it and work through the terrain and and deal with a day like that. If that's all you're worried about. Now, how about we step it up so we have a persistent weak layer? Maybe it's some facets sitting on top of a crust that have been buried for. You can kind of see a, a, a stair step feature over there. So it's been around for a couple weeks gets loaded, doesn't do anything, gets loaded again, and now you have like meter crowns, persistent weak layer. Who feels pretty confident, comfortable dealing with this kind of a problem? Being able to travel around, avoid it, and safely get around in the mountains. A lot of people are probably more iffy. Yes, no. <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> there we go. So yeah, it sounds like kind of wishy-washy. Is that a good way to describe how people react to something like that? Yeah. Okay, so then here's what we had going last year, where it's a buried persistent weak layer that was buried about, you know, let's say it's 40 days old, something like that. So it's been there for a while. Um, has gotten loaded, done, you know, produced avalanche activity through storm cycles. And then you get a rain event where the rain line varies anywhere from here to here. So the starting zone spans dry snow, mixed rain, rain snow, and then entirely rain. So who, feel, who feels comfortable dealing with something like that? It was interesting. When I did it at ISSW, there were these crazy old Norwegian coots who live way up north above the Arctic Circle. They're just like... No problem, you know, raising their hands. There were like three out of 800 people in the audience, but but there there were some, which I was surprised. What's that? I, I think so. <laughs> and yeah, I don't think they were drunk. It was because it was a morning talk. Um, it was Austria. <laughs> so in in general, though, it's uh, you know, you have. People who live in or work live and work in more maritime climates are used to dealing with rain on snow events and mixed rain snow and just kind of weird, is it wet, is it dry, that kind of thing. And people who work in intermountain or continental uh, snow climates, you know, farther inland, are used to dealing with persistent faceted weak layers that'll get buried and you'll see avalanches 40 days later. But there isn't a lot out there about when you combine these two. It's just something that in the past, you know, at least not, not very much has been written or published about it, period. So it was a, a really interesting cycle that we saw, and that was kind of the basis for, uh, for getting this paper together and looking at it and doing this case study. So we're going to do a couple things. Quick tour of a really interesting avalanche cycle, and fair warning, we ask more questions than we answer. This is not going to be like, aha, the huge epiphany that you go home with. Now I know how to deal with that. That's, uh, that's not what's going to happen, sorry. And I'll go back to something I use a lot. Don's well aware of this quote. Ian McCammon's graduate advisor, don't try to solve problems you don't understand. And I don't understand this. I think Eric can, I mean, he knows a lot about wet snow and, 
is you know both from a practitioner standpoint and academic standpoint. And I would guess that he's like, yeah, I don't understand that. When you have, I mean, it's some complicated things going on in the snowpack when you have wet and dry snow um, and persistent weak layers. Lump it all together. So everyone knows where we live. Uh, is there anyone here I'm looking around? I don't think there's anyone here from out of town. So uh, yeah, we're in Idaho. The wet part of the forecast area, sawtooth smoky crest, the saw smoky, smo saw, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> we can add Boise in there somehow if you want to too. But that's you know obviously much wetter than whoop, we'll go there. Then this area over here, which is the Wood River Valley. It should should have been playing. There we go. Ah. So yeah, and thanks to the guys up at uh, Sun Valley for, I can't remember if it was Scooter or, uh, or Richie that sent this to me, but you know, a really thin faceted snowpack. So it changes over a relatively short distance. You know, 30 miles you go from 40 inches of water to seven it, for uh, wintertime precip. It's a really dramatic difference. So back last season, that was our snowpack down in the Wood River Valley in early January. Um, it's impressive. You know, you just don't see that that often, I would guess. I don't know, I haven't been here that long, but that, that uh, says it all. Picture's worth a thousand words, right? So we're going to go over a couple key kind of little weather periods and events that happened during, <coughs> uh, during this season. So pre, you know, there's a little bit of snow there. There's a little bit that's off the map here. This is a... Uh, I'll try to not make this too painful, but you have two different weather stations there, Baldy and Ketchum. So Baldy's the purple, the Ketchum Ranger station's a green. And for those of you, that's about an inch of water right there, if you're not uh, quickly decimal literate. Um, so precipitation in millimeters. So this is just looking at precip, 24-hour um, precip that's recorded at those two stations. And then that's temperature, that's freezing right there. So we have a period of not a whole lot of snow and not a lot of precip going on. You look at the temperatures, they're you know, below freezing, above freezing. So what do you think is happening? Right there, right? So you have near surface facets or where it's really thin, the entire pack is faceting. Crusts, we did have a little bit of rain, so we had rain crusts up to about 9,000 feet um, in some places. and Sun crust facets, mixed bag, just basically junk as of you know early February right in there, so February 10th. Then we got a little more precip. Um, whoop, so that's, uh, I'm sorry, February 14th is the date that that was actually buried, so it's a Valentine's Day week there, the facet crust combo. And then you have this period of cold weather with small storms, so kind of a slow loading event. There wasn't a lot of wind associated with it either. Um, you have this basically a really soft slab building up, and we were starting to see some um, remote triggers, even with just this super soft like four finger slab. It was actually at an avalanche class. Were you teaching that? Helping teach it? The, it was airy. I was out in the field with um, someone from Jackson. Eric was around as part of that, but we were up in a you know safe spot, and there's no one below, but around kind of Titus Ridge out upstream of Verlands in the flats and you know it's just goose down there's almost nothing there's like 30 centimeters of fluff on top of it and remotely triggered something down below on the rollover so we're starting to see some stuff where it was pretty obvious that you know it's going to go off the caca is going to hit the fan when we do actually get a load on this thing which wasn't a surprise at all so then you get this first big storm um, about an inch and a half ish of water on March 2nd, there were a couple snow immersions um, saves at Baldy. It was absolutely amazing. You know, it was 15 to 24 inches of really dense snow in the Wood River Valley. No shock, you know, warnings, high danger everywhere, widespread cycle, everything's going as expected. So it's, uh, you know, so far no surprises. Everything makes sense, right? Then we go, you know, a little bit of uh, snow and rain here and there, but almost two weeks before, uh, you know, about 12 days before a, a few day loading event that even cumulatively, it's nowhere near what that was. 
And there was still a surprising amount of activity to, to us at the Avalanche Center that it, you think that it takes this huge thump on this incredibly weak weak layer that it's going to get most things that they're going to clean out if it's uh, you know in a steep avalanche path. But there was still a handful of both remote triggers and naturals going on in this you know four or five day window that it definitely uh, got us thinking. Okay, well this is you know far from over if you get this relatively small input that's going to cause more activity. So then March 22nd, 23rd, uh, 1.8 to 2.6 inches of water recorded in about 24 hours. Um, that was a lot more than was forecast, about an inch and a half, or excuse me, one and a half to two times what the models were predicting. But uh, it was a, you know, a lot of water, for, especially for the Wood River Valley in a 24-hour period. So the rain snow line that's in our middle elevation terrain kind of wobbled like it usually does between some range, but around 7,900 to 8,700. Um, came up with those numbers by being out the, the day of a little bit, but mainly the day after and the day after and the day after by just circumnavigating a whole bunch of different peaks, including Baldy, different tours in the Pios between Ben and I, and just looking at crusts where they formed on shady aspects. So we, got, we feel pretty comfortable in those numbers. They're not just pulled out of thin air based on weather models. Um, moderate to strong winds from the south and southeast. And we didn't see any significant avalanche activity by dark on the 22nd. At that point, about 60 to 70 percent of the, the rain and snow of so the precip had already fallen. And it was, it was definitely surprising. So we had, you know, well over an inch of water, you know, like 1.2 to 1.8 inches of water at that point. And I personally would have thought, okay, we're going to be seeing, you know, wet loose slides that are coming down and gouging into this weaker layer, whether it's wet slabs. But we just spent, uh, two or three of us spent all day pretty much driving around. It's like Mindbender, Greenhorn, just looking around for wet loose avalanches and things that had run to the bottom of the tracks. The visibility was really obscured that day. You can only see maybe 500 feet off the deck about, so you, you couldn't see up into the into the pass. You could see the runouts really well in the bottom of the tracks. But that was definitely interesting. One of the things that jumped out to me that uh, it, it appears that there was some sort of threshold that wasn't met by dark on the 22nd. Um, so then when the storm ended there, this is taken the next day on the 23rd. The precip ended that early that morning on the 23rd. And this is up in the um, Keystone Gulch area, so east of town, east of Sun Valley. And we saw these, they're not huge, they're you know, D2, D2 and a half, but they were all over the place in this middle elevation terrain. And in this relatively um, you know, small area, it's just a few drainages where it was uh, really highly focused. Um, and the crowns are all clustered in that middle elevation area, you know, what appeared to be kind of initially at, below, near the rain line. And it definitely got, you know, all our attention at the Avalanche Center. So it was, let's go start looking at these things and try to figure out what happened. Because there were just certain drainages that were just peppered with them. This is like a timber federal. And everywhere you looked, there's a crown right around the rain line. There, it was just a small area, probably like 10 square miles, a little more, 15 maybe. Probably a little bigger than that. But, you know, not, not a whole lot of drainage. Just that kind of pioneer's... Um, area east of town that uh, things just went off. It was really widespread. And then you went over on other, you know, other parts of the forecast area and nothing at all like this. So really uh, relegated to one specific area. So the elevation dependency, a um, couple things jump out here. This is looking at the number of occurrences, of avalanche occurrences that we recorded versus where it is in relation to entirely rain, somewhere within that rain-snow mix, or entirely all snow falling at the, at the crown level of the starting zone. And these observations, well, I guess first I'll say that the things that jumped out were things that were entirely all rain, there was one, which I would have thought that number would have been higher going into it, that where it rained 2.6 inches on a snowpack that hadn't had anywhere near that kind of water flowing through it yet. That, and that's, I guess, one thing I didn't mention. The snowpack had had some water penetrate down a ways, but it was, it's not like it is now where you'd already had 
water and established perk channels going all the way through it. It was nowhere near that when this happened. So that, that definitely jumped out. And then this rain-snow mix, you see this bump up, and then this big cluster right at the upper end of the rain-snow line and into the just dry snow line, which, you know, maybe that makes sense, and then it really tails off where it's all snow, and you would think getting probably less dense, drier as you go up in elevation. Some of this may be an observational bias that a lot of things, when, when you get up in upper elevations, they blow in, so you don't even see the evidence. You know, if you get two and a half inches of water with moderate to strong winds, you're not going to see D two and a half, so they're going to happen repeatedly. You're only going to see the things that happen at the very tail end. So there, these numbers probably would be higher if we actually had good observations. Uh, well, not good, but you know, really precise observations. So I think we, we did what we could. The observations are from basically Ben and I going and glassing things from wherever we could get and looking at avalanches and then visiting them when we could, the crown lines. So yeah, definitely this, this cluster here right at the upper end of the rain snow line and in the um, just snow area was definitely interesting. Um, aspect dependency. So at that point, you can picture similar to now, where south and southwest slopes are completely burned off their dirt. West is going that way, southeast is going that way, so it's going to be a, a really funky snowpack structure. You wouldn't expect to see a ton of avalanches on those aspects, but northwest, north, northeast, and east were fairly similar snow depths, fairly similar structure with the amount of melt and just you know that springtime transition that had occurred before then. And it, things are really clustered on northwest. Part of it is probably due to the way that the drainages are oriented, but there are an awful lot of um, north and northeast facing paths that didn't run in this area. So there's a, a really a definite correlation with northwest. It was pegged where that's where the action was, where it was happening. And these are the, especially the ones that are right around the, the rain line. So in this area, you can throw out the, the really high elevation slides there, which is the blue and kind of the crest of the pioneers. Um, as far as why that happened, it, the best guess, I mean, we're not going to have the answer because we just don't have the resolution in profiles and structure, you know, looking at things on a slope scale and just having detailed data, several pits on multiple starting zones over aspects, just with what our operation is, we can't do that. That's like what a ski area can do, but we don't have that luxury, unfortunately. So I, I think there were... Uh, the most plausible explanation is that there were some differences due to some really strong northwest wind events that we had after the weak layer formed when that snow was on top of it, but before the, so following that March 1st storm, the, the big one that really thumped the snowpack, or March 2nd, there were some strong wind events that definitely redistributed things and probably scoured northwest a lot more. So I think the underlying slab before the rain event was probably thinner on northwest than northeast. If that's a direct cause and effect, who knows, but that's just the, the one observation that, that I would have for uh, something that factors into that aspect dependency, part of the equation. So what? So why does this matter? Here's the, the cool part. We'll try to not get too far into conjecture. Um, so talking a little bit about failure mechanisms, which is uh, you know, outside of everyone in this room's wheelhouse, really, but uh, partially in some of some of the folks in this rooms. So you have a scenario where the top of the starting zones are entirely dry snow, really dense, moist, you know, probably right around zero C, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you have a bunch of the starting zone where you have something like this, that's, you know, 1.8 to 2.6 inches of water that's that thick. And maybe the water got a little bit further down, but not much. You can kind of see that's that's where it is. And then the structure, I mean, there's our dry snow. So all the second half of February and March snow before the 22nd, 23rd, there's our nice facets. That's that's what the snow surface was on February 14th, so not very deep. Um, yeah, one thing I didn't say is that we weren't issuing advisories or forecasts for this zone until that March 1st storm, because there wasn't enough snow to go anywhere until then. So we started on March 1st, or March 2nd, when that storm was, with a warning. But yeah, so going back to the, what you have in the upper part of the starting zone, 
this uh, really moist, damp snow. And then you have another part of the starting zone as you move down slope, where it's a mix of snow and rain that's really changing the surface properties. That used to be just dry snow, relatively, you know, there might have been a crust here and there, but in general, just dry decomposing fragments on the top, maybe some rounded grains. So adding a bunch of rain to that and two and a half inches of water is going to, does that make sense? It's going to really change whatever the surface properties of that slab are, which obviously has a, a big effect on what happens down lower in the snowpack and how that weak layer would be stressed. And then at the bottom part of the starting zones, and for sure in the tracks, we had water getting all the way down through the snowpack, wetting the faceted layers. So you have three different things competing there. At the top, you have this dry snow loading, and then you have this changing slab properties in the middle of the starting zone, and then you have a true kind of wet slab type scenario where you have a wetting front getting down into the weak layer, making its way through the slab. Um, well, I'll, I'll, a, a couple things. So I, this is kind of like a, some post notes from ISSW. So at ISSW, it was, uh, it was great. I talked to Alec Van Hergen, Van Herwigen, um, who's an SLF researcher who studies fracture mechanics, and he also um, pays attention to what's going on around Davos. And they had a really similar event the year before this one. So he'd done a lot of thinking about it and looking into it. And his thoughts were that, you know, that really incredible deformation that you have going on when you have a lot of really rapid, wet, well, not wet, rapid, moist, damp snow loading at the surface that the creep rates and the deformation rates are just through the roof. So he thinks that really plays a significant role in what's going on in this. Um, that was one of the things with the Davos slides. Same thing, they spanned it where it was raining at the bottom of the starting zone, dry snow at the top, and a mixed bag, a kind of a mess in the middle. That was something that he thought was uh, definitely important and worth looking at further. Then I had a chance, I did this talk up in Anchorage um, at a uh, kind of a forecasters meeting with the railroad folks and the forecasters and some ski patrollers. And um, it was an awesome experience. Basically, we use this as a kind of an intro to just talk about wet snow and weird stuff. And Dave Hamry, who's been up there, he, I think 37 years before he just retired, he said there were three different occasions where he was out wearing his rubber gear, uh, just looking at the water infiltration, how far down it was getting. And he didn't see the onset of, he'd, he'd seen it on three different occasions where he'd seen these similar events where he had a nice faceted layer way deep in the snowpack, um, meaning, you know, not in the last two, three weeks. So a, a good quality faceted layer. And he only saw the onset of avalanching once he was down way low in the tracks, once the water got to the weak layer. And then he said it was really quick that once the water got to the weak layer down there and started wetting it, that then avalanching occurred. So he's not saying that, yep, that's it, that's what's driving it. He's like, yeah, I saw it a few times. It was uh, something that definitely stuck in his mind over a 37-year career. Um, also up there, Mike Janes, who and Don actually got to play with this uh, this whole event and cycle at the Snedisham power plant outside of Juneau. Um, he was, you could see the wheels turn and he's kind of thinking, he's like, yeah, during that Snedisham thing, an awful lot of the crowns were just above the, the rain line. So they were in that kind of dry snow area, didn't quite have that, you know, true, obviously wet slab character where they were, you know, dry loading up top. And I'll, we'll have to talk about that more afterwards. You, were, you weren't there for the initial. You were there for the secondary one, right? OK. Um, and then more recently, this year, they had another similar thing, uh, similar cycle up in Alaska in March. After we had ours in February, they just started getting hammered. And Matt McKee, who's now taken over for Dave Hamry, I've been emailing back and forth with him. and. He said it was amazing. It was like clockwork where all the crowns in their big, you know, D3s to four and a half, so they're big slides. But almost every one of them was running above the slop, above where it rained, just into the dry snow is where everything was failing. Um, there were a couple that, that were uh, failing more in the rain line. And then every one that they triggered with explosives failed up in the dry snow, which... Um, you know, empirical evidence, take it for what it's worth. 
I think that's the thing that we're looking at, like, take all of this with a grain of salt. We're talking about a few different instances and a few different observations. So really the whole idea of this is to get you guys thinking, what have you seen, guys and girls? Or Yeah, there's two. Three. <laughs> so I want to, you know, that's the main thing. To, when you see weird stuff like this, share it with people. And I think it's, uh, it's really important as, uh, as time goes on because these things aren't that isolated, just that no one talks about them or writes about them is my hunch, especially after spending some time talking to people about this. So here's kind of an example. Um, we're going to wind it down here, but this is entirely dry up at one of those crowns in uh, it's either Keystone or might be Parker. I think it's Keystone. And then you can see how it's starting to see some obvious signs of uh, wet snow here. If you look at this kind of smeared stock wall flank thing, and you know that's obviously a, a wet surface. And then by the time you get down here, just looking at that, it's it's probably basically oatmeal that was wetted all the way down through it. The way that that you know there's there are no sharp lines down there. It's just this weird oozy thing. And that's how a lot of these paths were. As you went down and looked, you could find perk columns down. As you got down a ways, they'd go a little bit through the pack. And as you got down down into still in the starting zones, and a lot of them, and for sure in the tracks, it was obviously wet all the way to the facets at the bottom. Um, complex scenario. You have a lot of different things going on at the same time. There's no way I'm going to say which one is working, working um, or which one is predominantly driving scenarios like this. It's, uh, it's something that'll be really interesting to see what some folks who want to get PhDs and looking at mixed wet dry snow come up with in future years. So to wrap it up, uh, and this is the food for thought part that I think hopefully everyone can take home with them. So wet and dry snow and avalanches, they exist in a continuum. You know, sometimes it is entirely wet if you just have total slop and it's you know a mix of water it's basically a slurpee sometimes it's totally dry and we have these nice discrete boxes this is the european scenario for using avalanche problems this is the american scenario that they do a great job most of the time and we need to have a way to sort things both from a forecasting perspective for how to you know work through it in our own minds and from a communication perspective so I'm not saying, yeah, we need to get rid of the avalanche problems. Not at all. They, they work really well most of the time. But uh, this avalanche cycle and, and really a lot of wet, dry, mixed wet, dry, or varying degrees of wetness and dryness is where this discrete box approach really uh, breaks down. I think the, the most important thing is to you know recognize that uncertainty that it you are in a continuum, it's, it's not black and white, that most of the time, like two days ago, three days ago, you know, we're somewhere in there. You go up 200 feet, it's gonna change. You wait two hours, it's gonna change. So things change really fast on the wet-dry continuum, both spatially and temporally. You know, there, it's just a, a really fine line sometimes. You know, 50 meters up in elevation, you might go from here to there. It can change really quickly. And I think depending on what scale you're working on, for us as forecasters, it's more, it's, I mean, relatively simple. It's a communication problem for the most part. But we do need to look at it as a, a forecasting problem. I think it, it's easy to get stuck in that, okay, what's the dry snow danger? What's the dry snow hazard? What's my risk going to be due to dry slab avalanches? What's my risk danger hazard going to be due to wet snow avalanches? And there is this in-between where you kind of need to look at it a little more holistically, I think. I know personally I do, um, and I've tried to change that as much as I can to, to fit more of a continuum approach and not these discrete boxes. And I can only imagine, like, imagine if you're a highway forecaster and bummed that Bill and Chantel and the guys from uh, down there aren't here from the Stanley to Loman Road because they had this this year. But imagine if you're on a road that, Actually, you were tasked with keeping open. You couldn't shut for three weeks. So you had to make a decision to close it or to keep it open. And it's not a knock on them. It's an awesome luxury that they have that, you know, when the huge avalanches start coming down, it's like, we're done. We're going to clean up the piles when the cycle's over. But picture like a Colorado I-70 or a Seattle I-80 Snoqualmie Pass. 
you got huge pressure on you to keep the road open, shut it for a short amount of time, shoot it, do what you need to do, open it back up. So with things changing really rapidly, spatially, temporal, temporally, you know, over short amounts of time, and you, you're not quite at that threshold, like say that Monday night when we saw nothing for avalanches, I would have been nervous, you know, inch and a half of rain. I guess let's go shoot it. I mean, I don't really trust explosives in wet snow, but yeah, let's go see what happens, shoot it, and then they're going to say reopen it. It's like, well, I want to keep it shut until it quits raining. It's like, that's not an option. So I'm really glad I wasn't on that hot seat. That would have been brutal. Um, that being said, I you know picture that for whatever your specific job constraints, missions, goals are, you know how that affects your approach, kind of figuring out where on that continuum you are when you're looking at these kind of weird, wet, dry things, because just there is so much uncertainty, and that tends to be, you know, if we don't increase the amount of safety margin when the uncertainty increases, that's where professionals get killed. When things get weird and we don't increase our safety margins or get more cautious, um, just beware of that. And with that, that's all she wrote. <laughs> Questions?